Welcome everyone to CFHA Community Conversations. We're happy to have you join us today. Um, we're gonna get started here in the next few minutes as people are coming in, but just very briefly, um, a quick word about Community Conversations. It's a newer program for us and we're excited to have you join us. We're excited about what's coming up in the new year of 2022. We're um, looking to schedule this conversation on a monthly basis and bring you um, other topics that, have, that are of interest to all of you that might be circulating or percolating out there um, in, in your space. And we'll be sending out information on it as we get them scheduled and, and as the topics are solidified. So I'm going to turn it over to my co-facilitator right now. And I'm sorry for those of you that I didn't introduce myself to. I am Tanya Lauder. I'm the business manager and engagement manager for CFHA on staff and my co-facilitator, Corey Knight, I will turn it over to you. That sounds great. Thank you, Tanya. Um, so my name is Corey Knight. Um, I'm a doctoral student from the University of Houston Clear Lake. And so far, we've had some really fantastic conversations. Um, I'm, a, I'm one of the main co-facilitators of the community circles. Uh, and so as part of these, what we really want to do is hear from you. And just get an idea of, as we talk about each of these topics, really understand maybe where you're at, what questions you have, and really just what topics come to mind throughout this process. Um, one of the things we really like to do as well is keep an eye on the chat. And so I'll be keeping an eye down there in case any comments pop up, you know, but also feel free to chime in. Um, today we have an excellent speaker as usual. We have Neftali Serrano, uh, the CEO of CFHA. And today what we're gonna do is we're gonna talk about population health and integrated care initiatives. Really how these two things go hand in hand and, and also how we wanna have the greatest impact we can for all of our patients and really just reach as many people as possible. So Neftali, I'm gonna go ahead and let you take it away. Um, would you prefer that I just kind of chime in when we have the chat going and we have any questions or would you like to just kind of take a pause occasionally? Yeah, just let me know. Just interrupt me. Yeah, the the you know this is this is definitely intended to be really conversational and laid back. Um, so, and if folks were probably going to be a small enough group, or folks want to also unmute at some point, um, and you you know you can let me know if there's some folks with some particular comments that may want to unmute and just verbalize what they're they're wanting to say. That'd be fantastic as well. Um, yeah. What I'm going to do here today is just um, uh, provide a conversation starter. And uh, for that, I do have some slides, but I'm going to try to go as quickly as possible through those to take slides down and just um, really just have your thoughts on this. And population health is kind of a, well, let me, I, I love jumping into stuff, assuming everybody knows who I am. Um, I'm Neftali Serrano or Neftali Serrano, whichever way you are able to say it. If you're able to roll your R's, you can say it the, uh, the, the Hispanic way. Um, I am the CEO here at the Collaborative Family Healthcare Association. I am not an expert in population health. However, we do a lot of TA work here at CFHA and the interface of population health and integrated care has been something that's come up a lot. Um, certainly throughout my career, but certainly in the last five years, probably, it's been something that's grown over time. So I'm not going to speak to this from the standpoint of an expert. I'm going to speak to you from the standpoint of someone who's been in primary care for a whole long time and who um, has worked with um, uh, clinics who are implementing population health strategies and trying to think through how do we really substantially tie this into um, our integrated care efforts. So I think I've learned some things along the way, but I'm really interested to hear what you all are doing or thinking about and where your, where your brain space is at with this particular topic. All right, so uh, let me pull up those slides here real quick and get you some of the thoughts that I have on the topic. All right, let me just play on that. All right. So yeah, population health and integrated care. So this is sort of a summary of what I think people uh, are doing now when they say population health, like this is what the operational definition of it is. 
Um, you can go up on Wikipedia and actually it's pretty interesting if you do want to do a Google search at some point and search up population health, some really interesting variations on definitions, which lets you know that uh, lots of people use that terminology differently. So I'll just leave it at that there, but it, it's definitely people use it differently. And I think actually sometimes people use it inappropriately. Um, they call some things population health. They're probably not really terribly population-y, if that makes any sense. I just invented another verb there, population-y, as an adjective, adverb. Uh, so this is what people are doing, right? So this list, so, so screening, right? So you need, typically with populations, you're talking about grouping uh, portions of the population, right? So screening as a, as a strategy is often used for that. And, it, and it's not just like screening, we think of screening and behavioral health as like, you know, PHK-9, things like that. But remember, population health is across healthcare. So screening is actually something that's done um, uh, routinely in primary care, right? You go in and you get your blood pressure checked. Guess what? That's a population health intervention, right? That's screening. You're not there for blood pressure check, right? You might be there for a back pain or headache. Um, or something completely unrelated to blood pressure. But the standard is, hey, in primary care, we screen for, for uh, high blood pressure in order to capture the population and that has high blood pressure and hopefully do proactive, perhaps even preventative treatment for that, right? So screening is definitely one of those strategies. So especially right lately, the emerging screening strategies that I've seen are things around social determinants of health, right? So you may have uh, certain screening tools. There's that prepare tool um, that people often modify and use for screening social determinants of health, right? The idea is we have some strategy to target a particular part of the population, right? Care management is another uh, typical operation. I'm not even gonna try you know, the word that's there. It's the way that, that clinics work this out, right? So uh, care management is basically the idea that, hey, if we do identify a portion of the population through our screening strategies, what are we going to do to help support their efforts in improving their health? And so the idea is, oh, let, well, let's stick a person who can help that person in a particular way. Right, so if it's for that hypertension example, it could be someone who does regular follow-up phone calls with the individual to make sure they're taking their, their hypertension medications or maybe um, to do follow-up on, uh, make sure they come to their next visit, et cetera. If it's like social determinants of health, it might be even more in depth and care management could be more like a community health worker who might go into the space and troubleshoot um, the particular um, uh, disparity issues. Could be a housing issue, could be a food issue, um, could be quality of housing, whatever it is, right? So the care management is this sort of intervention, support, help for the person to, to meet, that, uh, meet that need. So in this, we'll talk about this a little bit later on. Um, this is actually one of the key areas that's been interesting because these roles do have sometimes some overlap with like BHC work, um, et cetera. And so the, the issue often that we find in TA projects is, well, what's the relationship between our care managers and our BHCs? Like, how do they work together? What, 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 you know, how do they overlap, et cetera? The other key thing that's usually a part of population health strategies are just the development of a registry or patient lists, right? And we'll talk about this later on, but, um, you know, we're still often seeing separate patient lists. So we'll have like a patient list for the hypertension and we'll have a patient list for the social determinants of health, but we don't see as much integration of those lists where we have all the patients who, who are vulnerable on some level, right? Maybe they have both hypertension and social determinants of health, right? But those lists are ways that we manage populations essentially. And then we have, um, we do, we, we do see a lot of targeting these subpopulations, right? So subpopulations are just these smaller aspects of populations. So a very typical one that we see is our, our folks um, who've had some contact with the emergency room. So 
Um, this is a subpopulation of folks who may be overutilizing the emergency department for care. And then we might put them on a registry. We might assign them a care manager to help them uh, utilize services in a much more efficient, proactive fashion. So they don't have to go to the emergency room. Maybe they will be more proactive and come to us in primary care, right? So that's an example of targeting subpopulations. And they, they can be tied to risk-based contracts or some sort of arrangements with a local hospital where the hospital feels they can save some money on this. And um, again, there's also, uh, there's been a lot of work on this over the years since the 2000s, really, when this whole idea of the patient-centered medical home uh, first came into being. Um, so a lot of population health has built off of that work, including the work around the HEDIS measures. So HEDIS measures, if you don't know what they are, are just these standard set of measures that are codified and in many health centers and health plans use them as sort of standards of care, standards of good care. So there's hypertension measures on that, there's diabetes measures, and, and yeah, there are behavioral health measures as well. So a lot of population health measures coalesce oftentimes around these HEDIS measures because the clinics are already working either on risk-based contracts um, um, or even value-based contracts at times. Uh, around their performance around these HEDIS measures. So clearly they want to orient their population health efforts to target the groups that would fall under the rubric of these HEDIS measures. So that's, that's a little bit of what we're seeing with what clinics are doing with population health. Now, who does the work, right? This is an important question and, and I'm curious to hear from you all, like who's doing the work at your place? And typically, population health has grown up to do its own sort of thing. Um, so you see care managers doing the work, you see nurses doing this work, you see QI directors doing this work, you see QI committees doing this work. And as I'll talk about here in a second, I think that there's some things that could be optimized there as far as who's doing the work to better reflect an integrated care team approach. So for example, I don't see as many BHCs doing the work and involved in that work, um, either at the system level or at the actual delivery level. Um, I don't see a whole lot of, um, honestly, I don't see a lot of primary care providers doing this work. I think they may refer folks to the population health team, but there's not a really an organic relationship between what the care team is doing often and what's going on behind the scenes with these population health teams. And then what I often see are, is this assumption that integrated care has a, um, a lot to do with population health. And I kind of want to say yes to that. Um, I'm obviously a champion of integrated care. And I think integrated care is awesome. And I think integrated care can do a lot of fantastic things to improve the quality of patient care along the continuum of of, of behavioral health issues, all the way to chronic disease management, to mental health issues, et cetera. And at the same time, I've, I've felt a little bit uncomfortable with how sometimes some people talk about these as, as if they're almost the same thing. And that integrated care is sort of the answer to a lot of these population health targets that people have. So whether you're targeting hypertension or the emergency department or social determinants of health, and I'd like to say that integrated care has a role for sure in a lot of these places. And in fact, I'll argue that I think we need to work on that overlap better um, and create really good teams that, inc that is inclusive of the population health teams as opposed to creating these silos. It's sort of the next slide here, but, but I also wanna be clear that I think a lot of the solutions to some of these uh, subpopulations may not have very much to do with integrated care. And I think we need to be honest about that, right? Like who's really gonna benefit from uh, integrated care when we define that as behavioral integrated care uh, versus other sorts of interventions, right? So I think that's a point that we wanna clarify a little bit. Um, now, the models of care are also interesting to think about. How do they overlap with population health, right? So, so PCBH definitely incorporates a population health mindset in its core, core philosophy, but um, 
is it really connected intrinsically to a lot of these population health efforts? Um, I think that's an open question. I think in most places we see folks, we see PCBH, um, especially clinics that are not as well developed being applied primarily to mental health issues. Um, and that may load on to things like keeping people out of the emergency department and such, but I certainly wouldn't sort of develop a PCBH service at a primary care clinic and expect that all the emergency department overutilization would be eliminated. Right? Does that make sense? Like that doesn't, that doesn't make sense. And in fact, the literature doesn't show that. I did a study with some colleagues in Madison uh, a few years ago that showed that there was some impact on emergency department utilization, but it wasn't, it wasn't a, um, you know, a, a uh, what you would probably call a robust impact, right? It was probably a more mild to moderate impact. COCM um, actually has some connections to population health approaches because COCM was built off of the chronic care model. That is a population health approach. It's built off the old diabetes uh, collaborative of the late 90s, early 2000s. So it's built on this idea of identifying a population, tracking them on a registry, providing an intervention, a set of protocols, et cetera. So in, in a sense, it, it does follow population health strategies um, the, the sort of the thing that um, is a little bit more difficult from a population, the broader population health mindset is that COCM can be limited as far as its impact across the entire primary care population, right? So it's, it's really targeting typically a, a subpopulation. And by design, it's only going to track, you know, a subset of individuals, right? So again, there's ways in which each of these models may have relationships to the work. But uh, there's also ways in which these are very different than the other population health efforts that a clinic is doing, right? So again, I, what I wanna encourage us is to think more, um, I just like to think more clearly and say, hey, um, yes, there may be some ways in which the patients involved in population health efforts could benefit from the integrated care, but that's not the totality of what we're, what's gonna help us reach our goals with population health. So this is sort of my brainstorm of what I think and my observations really of what I think, what I see is, is missing when I interact with a lot of clinics in a TA capacity. Um, and even in my own clinical practice, um, I do a little bit of clinical practice at UNC where there's actually a pretty robust population health team. Um, so we'll start from the left, the left graphic and work our way over um, just to visually describe these sort of issues. And I'm really curious to see what you guys think about these thoughts um, in particular. So I think one of the things that I mentioned before that I see is that you got a bunch of patient lists developing. Um, and there's not necessarily robust ways of connecting these patient lists, right? We're all working with the same patients, but we put them on different lists and then it may be my job to follow this list and somebody else's job to follow that list, right? Nurse care manager does this list. And um, at some point, we're going to run out of the capacity to manage all these lists, right? Um, it's sort of the problem of specialization, right? We can create these specialized lists, which does make protocols easier. Um, but, you know, we've got lots of disorders and conditions in the world, right? Um, at what point do we just get have just way too many lists to manage? effectively. So what I'd like to see are um, something more in that sort of middle category or that middle graphic, right? Where instead of like, instead of categorizing patients by very particular disorders, right? So like we have a depression list and then we have a diabetes list. And even instead of just doing, well, let's just, what well, some clinics do, let's mix the two lists. We'll have a depression and diabetes list, right? And yeah, there's some rationale to that for sure. But instead of doing that, I, I'd like us to get to a place where we um, develop vulnerability scores so that we're, we're really working with patients who um, have an aggregate of issues, concerns, deficits, social determinants, et cetera, that are crucial in our communities. So I don't think that we're gonna be able to come up with a national vulnerability score. I think, I think the ship has sailed on that thing. 
But I do think by community or even by clinic, really, we, we ought to be able to come up with a way to, to quantify, hey, if a patient has this, this many things on their problem list and these many medications and these particular diagnoses and these particular social determinant cells and these ACE scores, you know, we can score them in a way and then provide particular extra attention on those folks and have enough of a diversified intervention that we are able to meet needs in different areas, right? Now, obviously that's much a much more sophisticated approach it demands a lot more flexibility. But to me, that's what we've learned in integrated care, that when you're able to provide a flexible, just-in-time type intervention, that those interventions are typically the most potent interventions in creating change in patients. So that, that's more of what I'd like to see. Now, I'm not smart enough to come up with that sort of um, algorithm on my own, but I do think that we're getting closer to that. I think actually that AI will be a big help with that as AI starts influencing our EHRs and starts be able to cull all of that robust data that we already have and really be able to predict which patients really need that kind of support. And I think at that point, we're going to start seeing the diminishment of these individual lists and more attention to this idea of vulnerability. And then that's going to require more flexibility on the part of our care managers and our care teams to flexibly then intervene, right? So with one patient, they might need an air conditioner for their asthma, and that might be the intervention. Another one might need monthly phone calls, right? And another one might need, you know, to get connected in with the uh, COCM service, right? Uh, because of their, uh, their particular state. Another one might need to be uh, proactively managed with the BHC and the care team, right? So we need to be more flexible with that. And that's gonna, that's gonna take us to that last graphic there, which is having integrated teams with overlapping skills, right? So again, this is really based on one of the key lessons of integrated care and building teams in integrated care, where what we have learned is that when you have teams that operate in um, a very flexible, fluid fa fashion with overlapping responsibilities with lots of good cross-pollination, you have BHCs who develop medical knowledge and skills, and you have physicians and medical providers who develop behavioral health skills, and you add to that care managers, right, who then also, if they're really integrated, develop skills there as well, and everybody cross-pollinates, you really have a much more flexible, fluid team that can uh, flex with each individual particular patient's needs so that, for example, a particular visit may need the care manager more than they need the BHC or the physician, right? And so the team, if they're arrayed correctly, will identify that appropriately and allocate the right lead to that particular uh, patient's case. And again, any of these members could lead depending upon the situation uh, presenting with the patient. So again, this is higher level stuff. We're not there yet, but this is where I would really like to see us go with regard to how we form our teams. All right, so what else is missing? Well, um, if again, we start there on the left uh, graphic there, I think I am kind of forecast this before, I think there's a separation right now between our population health teams and the population health efforts and our care teams. And so um, we really, I think, need to define what role the care teams that are seeing patients on the ground each day, um, what their role is, other than just sort of identifying patients and sending them over to care management or to the population health team. Like, I think that's not enough. And I think we're doing a disservice. We're just creating more of that specialization and that siloing that we're trying to break down in the health system. It's got to be a much more integral interplay between what happens in population health. And I know that's difficult because even in, in my setting, right, um, the population health folks are, are in a whole different space. Um, if, and, and there's not an easy way for me to know if the patient is involved with population health. If I happen to see in the list of encounters a phone call or phone contact that the population health person had with the patient, then I know they're there. 
But that's the only way that I really am going to know, as I see them on the floor, that they're connected in with these folks. And a lot of times, what I found in a lot of clinics is most of the folks on the ground don't even know what the inclusion criteria are for patients to be eligible to work with the folks in population health, right? So I probably have missed out on potentially connecting patients to population health because I don't know whether they're eligible for that or not. So that kind of thing really does need to be worked out more robustly on the, on the clinic level and as far as how these teams uh, relate to one another. Like I said, I, I, I could conceive of a future where the population health specialist is the person who comes in and meets with the patient at the visit, at the point of care when they come in. Um, and that, that might be the most robust use of the patient's time uh, as opposed to starting off the visit traditionally with the physician. So as we go around that, that circle of getting to the population health target, the other key piece is um, the role that external agencies play. Right, so uh, especially with social determinants of health, the implication is that we don't actually in our in primary care have all the tools to solve these issues, and um, I think we're still struggling sometimes with connecting with partners in an integral way in the community to solve those social determinants of health issues. Um, we all know that like handing patient a list of the local food pantries may not be the best way to solve food insecurity, right? Um, it would be much more robust if we had a relationship with food and food service providers or, or food pantries or an organization focused on hunger and we're able to connect that person in to facilitate, hey, these are ways you can get food consistently, right? Because there may be a lot of assumptions that a patient makes around what a food pantry is. And we give them a piece of paper to go you know, go to the food pantry, but that's not, not going to get the result that we need because they have a different conceptualization. Oh, only these kind of people go to food pantries, so to speak, right? So those relationships with external agencies, I think is still a big time work in progress, as is the information flow between those two. Fortunately, I have seen some technological solutions that are coming to the fore around that, like ways in which if we refer someone to an external agency and we're on the same sort of system, um, there are some systems that are working out where you can actually see that the patient went, they were met, and what kind of services they got, and you get feedback from that so that, again, it influences your care at the point of care in primary care where you're able to see, yeah, they followed through with this, they got help, they went to the food pantry, et cetera. So technology has a, an important role with this as well with regard to um, how are we going to track this? How are we going to make this make sense? Um, and I think there's some good solutions uh, that I think are beginning to come to the fore. Now, with all of this, there's also an organizational issue that uh, is in the background that I often think about, which is who manages all this stuff, right? So again, up, those of us on the floor in primary care, we're just dealing with the day-to-day. Right, I mean, you know what it's like if you work in primary care. You, you see the patient, you write your note. You see the patient, you write your note. Maybe at the end of the day, or when you have a pause, you do some follow-up phone calls. You go through your list, of your in basket. You work on stuff, but it's mostly like we're we're we've got the blinders on, and we're working here, here, you know, right here today. Um, but there's got to be someone who really manages this sort of from a big picture standpoint to say, hey, are, are we actually doing a good job? Is it, who's doing the air traffic control basically? Now, conceptually, there's often a population health director or a QI director or even a QI committee that is sort of supposed to be providing this oversight. But I don't think that we've got that quite right because a lot of times those, those folks are not intimately connected with what's happening on the floor and or worse yet, th those folks are not giving the power and authority necessary to enact changes, to be agile with strategy, to engage clinic clinicians. They often have to go through other people to get those things, get, get changes made in the AHR, or get changes made in flows on the clinic floor. And, and that really, I think, hampers population health efforts um, because that, those folks don't often have the power to make those changes. So I, I think that's one of those things, again, I, I'm not saying I have the answers, but it's definitely one of the things I've thought about. All right. Nef so I've talked way too long as usual. Oh, can I can I jump in for a sec? Yeah, this is the last slide. It's just asking okay. people what they thought. Yeah. Yeah, I don't say and I think that's a that's a 
a timely point. Um, you know, just looking at the chat, there was a couple observations. One was talking about the realization that things are correlated and connected. So your social determinants of health, chronic illness, um, looking through trauma histories. And so uh, Alexander had talked a lot about that earlier, just how all these things are connected and really brought up that because there's correlation and there's strong evidence, I mean, that's some of the backbone what we need to inform this kind of work. Um, something I wanted to look at too was uh, Maggie had mentioned as well, who manages this, and you had talked about that. I think another thing that comes up is who pays for this, because that's there's a lot of things we want to do to help our patients as part of you know chronic, uh, quality patient centered care. And so, do you have any feedback about that, Naftali? So I thought this was supposed to be a community conversation where other people had answers, not me. I was I was the one that was coming up with the questions. You guys are thinking I'm going to have the answers, and that, that's a different. Uh, no, I'm kidding. So I, I really don't have answers <laughs> to that, but I will say that people, and and this cuts across lots of things, right? And and actually, if Sandy can unmute at some point, and if you're able to talk, Sandy, I'd love to hear you talk about your comment. But to the issue of payment, I think that's actually part of what's driving some of the things that are missing in those slides that I said that things are missing because payment often drives like what you're going to do clinically from a protocol standpoint, right? So because things are paid for from a population health standpoint, usually through like, it could be like a risk-based contract or agreement. And so then you start focusing in on that one, one issue. It often does, as Maggie pointed out, um, or sorry, as Allison pointed out, it does silo the, the work, right? And, and, and that, that's really unfortunate, right? Because the strategy is something that should cut across lots of issues, lots of conditions, but it's only being applied to the one subpopulation. Uh, to the point where like, it can be frustrating for a clinician because then we might have a patient that we're seeing and I think this patient could benefit from some care coordination or from care management. But I send them, oh, they don't meet inclusion criteria. They don't have Medicare, right? So it's that kind of thing that causes a problem. Um, and I don't know how our um, multi-payer system can be rejiggered to not have that happen. I don't know that that's possible, right? Because all of this is usually worked out payer by payer. Um, I don't know, I can, I can pontificate, you know, and I can say, hey, if payers could get together and much like they sometimes like uh, pharmaceutical companies do this with uh, pharmacy benefit, programs for folks who can't pay, right? They sometimes get together for that kind of thing. If payers could get together and say, hey, these are, these are uh, a set of areas that we we're willing to work together on, that might work. Um, or the other thing is if you have a really creative CEO at a clinic or health system that's willing to take a little bit of risk and say, look, um, we're gonna pool all the money that we get and generalize our clinical strategy. We're not gonna specialize it. We're not gonna silo it. Um, and we'll take the risk of what that, you know, kind of ends up looking like um, from an outcome standpoint. I, I can maybe see that working, but I, I don't know. I don't have a great answer for that. And I'd love to hear from Allison as well, because it looks like you're, you're, you're feeling exactly uh, what we're talking about here, that the funding is creating some of the siloing, which is then unfortunately create, recreating the problem that we're trying to solve with population health, right? Allison, you want to comment here and then I'll let Sandy, if he wants to talk. Sure. Um, I mean, yeah, definitely what you said resonates with me. Um, and I think we're actually in the place right now where we're trying to address these problems by doing some restructuring. And it hasn't happened yet, so I don't wanna to speak too prematurely, but what we're thinking about is how to kind of break down some of those silos and integrate population health and then 
of course, that will um, trickle down to kind of changes in how population health is funded by integrating quality management, quality improvement, population health, our, our kind of data and business intelligence um, to, you know, to really just streamline our processes. Because right now, I think population health is kind of viewed as a side, kind of just like a, you know, a little extra benefit um, that works alongside the clinical teams, but not necessarily something that is a, I mean, the expectations are not there at the kind of executive level that the clinical teams use population health information to inform their, their work. Yeah, so let me propose something kind of uh, audacious here, Allison. So I actually think that if we were to start from scratch, because a lot of this is also just history and tradition of how clinical services have developed, right? That population health teams would actually be driving the care teams, if that makes sense, right? Because what the population health teams would be is like playing air traffic control on the panels and then driving the teams and have the authority to drive the teams. Like right now, there's a power differential, right? So the population health teams are, like you said, they're, they're more like down here in the hierarchy or maybe like over here, <laughs> right? A little bit too far removed. But I, I think actually population health should have authority over the care teams to be able to drive and say, hey, these sorts of things need to happen with these subsets of patients. Um, and even on a day-to-day -day clinical level, I think it'd be really interesting to have a, have a report of like, hey, these are patients who are vulnerable right now in your panel. Uh, please reach out to these folks, right? And maybe at that point, then I reach out to my care manager for assistance to do some phone, co phone contact, and I take some of that work, or the nurse takes some of that work as well. But I think the idea of, of where that is being driven is really important. Right now, I think if I'm hearing you correctly, it's true in your place as well. It seems like population health is doing their thing here based on maybe some information collected down here at the care team level, but then nothing really goes back and forth other than just a note. Yeah, that, exactly. That's no, that, that I, I couldn't have, yeah, I could not have said it any better. Um, and I think, you know, we oftentimes do, do, really great work, but it's work that is tied to, as I kind of said in the funding con, tied to grants or tied to other partnerships and collaborations with our payers. And which, you know, which works well, because when you have this kind of external, um, you know, you, you have the, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, oh my goodness. You know, you know, when you have the structure and the requirements, whether it's through a grant or some type of collaboration or, you know, payment model, we do a lot of pilot work. Then, then it works really well. We're having a hard time breaking kind of beyond that and doing what you said, really kind of driving the, the clinical work at the organization beyond these kind of little pockets here and there. Yep. So there's some great comments here, uh, Corey, um, about vulnerability scores and how, how that's defined. And again, this is an, an example of where I don't have the answers. I just have the great ideas. Um, way back when, and this is something that I've been looking at for the course of, throughout the course of my career. But way back when, when I was at the University of Wisconsin, there was uh, the ARNT score. There's a professor at University of Wisconsin, Brian Arndt, uh, in family medicine, who was trying to come up with one of these vulnerability scores, right? So basically, for those of you who maybe not, not as attuned to this, right? So um, a vulnerability score is just an algorithmically applied um, score that ranks a patient um, across, could be purely across physical health, but often I conceive of it as across physical, behavioral, psychosocial health indicators. So the idea is that this score would be predictive on some level, right? It's predictive of outcomes. Much the same way that um, ACE scores in some ways are a kind of vulnerability index, right? Because an ACE score of four or above, um, actually even an ACE score of two or above, but especially an ACE score of four or above um, from literature predicts a certain uh, proclivity to, uh, or vulnerability to outcomes 
uh, poor health outcomes on health and behavioral health indicators that have been seen, uh, seen in the re research. So that that that's the kind of thing when I talk about a vulnerability score, that's the idea of having a cross-cutting way of identifying patients as opposed to like an A1C score, which is just going to look at one particular vulnerability, which is a vulnerability to obviously the impact of diabetes. So um, to your question, Christine, how am I defining vulnerability? I don't have a definition of vulnerability. There has to be a mathematic algorithm that comes up, that, that you come up with. And I, again, back in those days, I was hoping that like Arndt score or other folks sort of research in that area would come up with a cross-cutting nationally accepted. In fact, I, I really thought back then, this was probably the late uh, mid 2000s. I thought in 10 years, we're gonna have a score that applies to everyone everywhere. In 10 years, we're gonna have that happen. And it hasn't happened, obviously. But what I've kind of learned about healthcare since that time is what we all have learned that all healthcare is local. And everyone who's come up with these population health strategies seems to come up with their own wrinkle on it. Every clinic I go to, every locality I go to, and that's because they define vulnerability differently. In other words, they see things in their community and they also see the resources that they have to help differently, clinic to clinic, region to region. And thus, vulnerability is then defined locally. And I hate that from a scientific, my scientific mindset hates that idea. And yet I've really come to accept it, that I think that's actually the right way, that, that there should be some localization of vulnerability. Um, and, 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 and I think that that's the right way to do it. So I think everybody has to, it's not that everybody has to be a mathematical genius and come up with a whole different thing. I think there's some ways to standardize how you come up with these algorithms. But I think that everybody has to uh, fine tune that definition of vulnerability um, based on your local context and your population. Um, even if you think about the impacts of racism and uh, uh, the impact of, of the uh, systemic historical impacts, it's gonna look different in different communities and sub-communities, right? And how you load that onto a vulnerability index, I think is local. Like, I think that's something that has to happen within that population in some ways defined by the community. So that's how I define it. Now, Mark, I'm interested to know because I don't know too much about that particular vulnerability score. I don't know if you're able to unmute, Mark, but um, if you are, otherwise, if not, if you could type, um, can you describe what, to the best of your knowledge, what loads onto that CPC plus? Yeah, so the it's comprehensive care plus, and it, it's um, it's a payment mechanism that some of our practices have. Uh, Michigan and ha is heavily loaded with a lot of providers in this area, and and so it primarily takes into account chronic disease. Uh, I think it also includes uh, alcoholism, a few other behavioral factors, but basically it pays the primary care physician a bonus for taking care of those patients because of the tier, it's tiers one, two, three, and four of that that they represent. Uh, and that that extra bonus money can't be paid to the primary care physician, it has to be paid to other. Oh, Mark just cut out for us. Sorry, I was just getting to the providers, the practices. Uh, Sorry, Mark, you were cutting out there. Yeah, my my internet's always not the greatest, but okay, yeah, so, you're back with us. So again, that's how some of our providers have been able to get behavioral health providers into their clinics because uh, of this additional bonus payment. Um, and so I was thinking again, I don't have. Uh, I was trying to look up the details of exactly how it's paid, uh, but it is primarily. It doesn't take it. I know it doesn't take into account things like uh, uh, SES or ACEs or um, some of the other things that we would typically think it, it is CMS came up of it is as an algorithm of those diseases that, and I think it includes number of meds 
that are most likely to predict bad outcomes. Um, and so uh, I thought it might be an interesting starting point for one of these things you're looking at, so. Yeah, thanks, Mark, I appreciate that. Yeah, I'd, I'd read about the CPC Plus uh, thing recently, uh, but I didn't know what loaded onto their risk score. And so that's helpful to know that it's, it's um, seems like it's more biologically based risk score than um, psychosocial potentially in, in nature, which I think is, you know, I, it, it could be a good starting point. I think hopefully we'll learn from that uh, pilot piloting of the CPC plus uh, involved clinics and maybe learn some things about having a cross-cutting vulnerability score or risk score. Just looking here at some of the other comments. Anything else stand out to you, Corey? Well, I was looking at the comment by Hez right there, um, talking, basically looking at mirroring uh, medical referrals and the medical referral process and how that might, I guess, extend to population health and maybe allocation of resources, maybe even re uh, referring somebody for, like, I remember the air conditioner example you had mentioned previously. Um, I know a lot of times we refer individuals possibly to care coordination for, you know, different needs. So has, I don't know if you want to speak up and talk a little more about that or maybe share some thoughts with us about that. Uh, sure. Yeah. So this is my first entry to CHFA and talking. So hello. Um, oh, welcome. And right. Yeah. Hey, thanks. And so my background, I'm a primary care operations manager and I now uh, partner with Dr. Elman Dixon on integrated care at Gunderson. So that I'm a primary care gal born and bred and I'm ops. I know nothing clinical. But I think that having worked in both of those worlds, I managed a team of community health workers. And I think what we kind of fell into was why do we keep treating like this? Like it's not something that our clinicians already have to do for a variety of other things, right? So we have swarmed resources around diabetes. We have swarmed resources around asthma. We have done this before. Why do we, and this is me talking with that lens from them, not me using that voice with y'all. I'm sorry, I don't mean to be disrespectful. Um, but why do we try and recreate the wheel when these systems are so embedded and archaic and hard to change? Why can't we look at going to the insurance companies and saying, what do you want us to reduce cost on? You've done it with this, and this is the information it needed and the type of reimbursement it needed and the type of FTE it took. Let's not recreate this. Remember, if you create a specialized unit of nurses that do this, it's going to fail in four years. You've learned that already, people. Let's go back to what we know, which is put these resources in primary care where they're needed, where behavioral health bubbles up, get them on the preventative end of things. And I think sometimes when I'm, because I'm now in behavioral health departments, I sometimes feel like there's like this gap in between primary care. They, they act like we're on two different teams. And it's like, but we're still in the same game, guys. Like, <laughs> like you know, your issues with managing, you know, uh, end renal, whatever, is going to be very similar and have some of the characteristics of someone going through a psychotic episode. You know, like there are some things that we know our system reacts poorly to. That can be medical or psychosocial. And I know that may be offensive to anyone who has, you know, has a lot of role in triaging those things and seeing them as different. And, but for me, operationally, like you give me one pathway to train nurses and community health workers on, and man, oh man, is that going to work better than trying to pretend like this is special and different and needs to be handled and considered differently as a result of that. That takes a lot of give up on the part of the clinician part, but I, I just have seen that happen over and over again. And so thanks for listening to my babbling contribution. I'm now gonna go and put out a fire. So I'm gonna leave the discussion. And uh, yeah, this has been really helpful from part of, so thank you for that. I no, appreciate it. Has you are welcome anytime. That, that comment was on fire. So go put out the fire, but your comment was on fire too. That was fantastic. So yeah, I think that that lines really well with what I was trying to say is sort of missing. And I, I love the wrinkle that has added to this, which is like, hey, actually there's some existing pathways we know and, and there's some learned history here. Yeah, absolutely. Like we don't have to reinvent the wheel. Um, I, I do think that the specific example in the, in Hez's comment about community resources is, um, you know, the, the, those pathways are well-worn in primary care, but they're not, they haven't been terribly successful. I would say, I think there's still a lot of issues with the way community resources are, are handled, like I pointed out when I put up the slide. So I think there's some real optimization that's needed there. But I think in general, the idea that 
if you create a cross-trained team, right? So if you have nurses and you're trying to have them operate at the top of their license, why would you dedicate them just to diabetes and just to following that track? Like I get from a, sometimes from a QA standpoint, it's easier because you just have one protocol to follow and you can sort of, you know, just hit those, those marks. But why wouldn't you have a cross-trained person who can cross over uh, either a bunch of different patient lists or def different conditions, or ideally, we have more of a generalized vulnerability index that hi highlights the vulnerable patients in the population. And then you have professionals on the team that can be brought in to um, interface with that patient strategically based on the particular vulnerabilities of that particular patient. That makes sense, right? So again, the idea is like, sometimes the nurse care manager might be the best person to work with that person. And sometimes it might be the BHC. And sometimes it might be the consulting psychiatrist. And sometimes it's a PCP, right? Um, we like to create systems that just have very tried and true, this is what you do. You call the patient three times in six months. And you, you know, do labs at these times and, and that. And that's fine because it's easy to manage, but it doesn't actually do well for actually doing population health unless you conceive of population health as a bunch of disparate populations for which you apply unique interventions to, to each of those populations. Does that make sense? That, that's my argument in a way. I don't know if that rings true for anybody, but that's, that's the concern that I have as we do this. Now, one, one other question here in, um, Sandy, I'm not sure if you're on or not at this point, but if you can and, and are able to unmute for this, I'm really curious, particularly for those of us in the integrated care space, what that relationship is between BHCs and, and this work. Um, I was just doing some coaching with a BHC this morning and that question came up. She was like, uh, you know, there's these care coordinators here and I'm not sure like what they do versus what I do and how we're supposed to be working together. Are we supposed to be working together? You know, uh, that's another key point that I'm interested in sort of um, exploring, like how those two roles do overlap, don't overlap, um, how those professionals are supposed to work together with one another. So if any of you have any thoughts or ideas about that, and Sandy, if you are on, happy to take your thoughts on it. I don't think Sandy's on it anymore. Naftali, okay. just, just looking right. through the list. Yeah. I know he, for, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead, Carl. No, say, I, I just know for myself, working with care coordination, the environment that I'm in right now, it can be particularly difficult sometimes because our offices are like literally down the hall from each other, but sometimes the communication's not super great. And we run into issues where they're, we get some in, some in, inaccuracies from patients about, well, this is what I was told by care management. And then we have an issue where, okay, now we need to go back and clear this up because for populations that I work with, they're from different parts of the world. And so they're trying to navigate going back home, family issues, um, just a whole host of issues regarding also external services. So you know, they may have an issue where we, they have a child that needs like a power chair, for example. Well, we have to coordinate community resources for that. Well, that's expensive. If, expensive and if people aren't communicating well, it's like now we're, that child may not get that before they're supposed to go home. You know, so I can think just from our end, it's like there should be a lot of overlap and we should be working together, but sometimes it doesn't quite work that way. And it can be frustrating. Yeah. So again, the learning that we've had over many decades now in integrated care should teach us about what the issues are there, right? So we know that there's structural issues and the comments have highlighted some of those. Payment is an issue. Um, but I think also the design of these roles is an issue, right? Um, if you design the role as a specialized service, much like if you just bring a specialty mental health professional, we've learned, yeah, you can bring the service of specialty mental health into the clinic, but if you design it as a specialty service, 
it's not going to operate smoothly with the day-to-day -day lifeblood of primary care, right? We've learned that. So there's certain strategies that we have to apply. It's usually what you do with PCBH or COCM to make sure that they are integrated. They're part of the care team, right? So I think, I think it's not that difficult. I think we just have to kind of think about these care coordinators in much the way, same way we would think about how do we integrate that BHC, right? How do they become part of what we do day to day? How do we communicate? How do we curbside? How do we warm handoff? How do we have shared medical appointments? Um, how do we use the electronic health records to optimally communicate with one another? I think if we apply some of that same learning, we start thinking about these things in a very, very different way and breaking down some of that siloed. It is going to take a little bit of courage because if some of those things I talked about, the risk scores and not sticking to individual patient lists um, uh, necessarily, or at least combining patient lists at a, at a bare minimum, uh, those take a little bit of courage, right? Because there's not a lot of tried and true worn um, history of doing a whole lot of that. But I think we have something to add. Now, Allison has a good point here. Uh, wish we could use our care coordinators to translate pop health work to clinical work and client supports. But as of now, our care coordinators are dedicated to our primary care team and health coordinating between behavioral health and primary care, as well as external resources. Yeah, that's that's typically, that is very typically the, the situation there. They're sort of like mini social workers um, in a lot of ways in, uh, in the clinics. And so then they don't, they, they yeah, that's a great point. They're not able to be a bridge oftentimes. Uh, in fact, they often see their roles as completely different, even though they may be working with the same patients and um, actually using similar strategies. It's not like care coordinators and care managers use, whole, like they both pick up phones. I know that. They both talk to other organizations. I know that. And I know they both talk to patients, right? If you, if you break stuff down to that level, it shows you how sometimes ridiculous the specialization is that we've created with all of these different roles. Like we we talk to patients on the phone, we talk to them in the exam room, we talk to other organizations. We we have definitely have different knowledge bases and things like that. So I don't want to make fun of that, but you know it's really different. And Christine Dyer, our agency decided to set up a monthly bi monthly meeting between the BHCs and Pop Health to coordinate. Great. And I think that's actually a great place to end the conversation on, Christine, because that's actually one thing I forgot to mention, which is what I often recommend for burgeoning integrated care programs. Again, whether you're doing PCBH or COCM work, um, is you're someone on your team, hopefully your behavioral health director, should be meeting regularly with your Pop Health people. Like that, that should, even if there's not a, 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 a natural institutionally mandated synergy, if I was in that role, I would still be saying, hey, can I show up to your meetings, right? Because I want to know what you guys are working on. And I want to know how it is that what you, how your work might connect to the work of our team on the care team level. So I think that's a, that's a good step, Christine, to make sure that you're your BHCs and pop health um, are at least talking to one, to one another at a very bare minimum. And out of that, you can get creative around, hey, uh, actually it'd be great if, if there's some way we could see a flag that if we open a chart, it tells us that this person is connected to you guys, right? There's all sorts of creative things I think that you can come up from that. All right, well, that's all I got. Um, it's two o'clock. Thank you all very much for engaging in this conversation. I really appreciate it. It's kind of the nerdy side of me. I really love the interface of clinical and operations and data. Um, and who knows, maybe we can like continue this conversation at some point in 2022 as these converse community conversations develop. If you do, please hit up Tanya. And if you do want to kind of continue this conversation on some level, you can always email me personally, because I'm interested in this particular area, or head up and or head up Corey and Tanya, uh, because they're going to be coordinating these conversation spaces every month. So.
Thank you for attending everyone today. We were glad to have you and we'll look forward to seeing you hopefully at the next conversation. Thank you, Naftali. Yep. Thank, Thank you, Naftali. You. Thanks everyone. Um, bye, Allison. Bye, everybody.